at Revelation chapter number 21. We'll begin reading in verse number 9. The Bible says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Let me just stop right there. If you're saved, he, John, the revelator, some 2,000 years ago, is blessed to go to the future and see you in heaven. Hmm? I don't know if that excites you, but it excites me because I read in the Bible I'm already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The only thing keeping me from heaven, I mean my citizenship's there, my conversation's there. The only thing keeping me from there is this old body of flesh, this body of clay. One of these days we'll lay it off and have a glorified body just like the Lord's. Uh, but I'm not going to preach on that. Verse number 10, and he carried me away. And by the way, you might be real reserved and don't get real happy in the service. You don't act like Brother Phil. That's okay. God made us all different. We all got different fingerprints. We all got different traits. You might not get real emotional. You might not get real carried away down here. But there's a day you're going to get carried away. But anyway, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy Jerusalem descended out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. It had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed twelve thousand furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the, twelve, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second a sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies. We thank you for the good time of fellowship before the service. We thank you for being a good God. We thank you for the hope of salvation. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, we pass from death unto life. And, Lord, we're thankful for that blessed hope that one day this city we just read about will be uh, our abode and will abide with thee forevermore. And, uh, Lord, we're thankful for the day you came to where we was and reali we realized our lost condition, but we realized you went to Calvary and paid our sin debt. And, Lord, uh, through repentance and faith, we put our trust in thee and God. Thank you for the precious promises of the Word of God. And thankful, Lord, on us Wednesday night in January, we can come out and worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, Father, I do pray for Miss Judy that, Lord, you'd touch her and help her. Uh, I pray for Seth as he's recovering from surgery. You'd touch him and help Miss Brittany as she's not feeling well. And, God, I certainly do pray for the Hensley family. You'd be with them tonight. But the Father, the others that, Lord, are providentially hindered and can't be here, God, help them and be with them. Lord, these that have assembled and found themselves in the house of God, God, I pray you'd meet with us in a wonderful and powerful way. 
God, I pray that, God, you would uh, uh, just roll back uh, uh, the veil a little bit and give us uh, just a little glimpse of what you have in store for us. Uh, God, I pray that, God, you'd give us cause to rejoice, uh, but also, God, I pray you'd give us a little reviving. Uh, God, help us to go forth from this place, uh, carrying a burden for souls, uh, being a light to this dark and depressed world. Uh, God, this world doesn't have much hope. Uh, Lord, they're trusting in the things they can do and trusting in riches and trusting in the words of man. Uh, God, help us to share with them uh, uh, the only place they can really have hope and an eternal hope, and that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now, Father, use this unworthy vessel. Uh, God, glorify your name. Uh, have your will and way. We'll bless you for it, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. We ask these things. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, uh, I want you to notice a few things uh, from these verses. Uh, I want you to, first of all, notice the sights of the city. And then the Bible gives us a little bit of a, 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 a glimpse. And Miss Mary, we know that it hasn't entered in the heart of man what God uh, hath gone to prepare for them that love him. Uh, and my dear friends, uh, 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 I promise you this thing, uh, uh, none of us has ever seen what we will see one of these days. Uh, none of us has ever even got a, uh, our minds wrapped around the beauty and everything that God has got in store for us. Uh, uh, can you imagine uh, 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 the very heaven, the abode of God that he has dwelled in since the alpha of time? Uh, ever since we started recording time, you can go back beyond that where God's dwelt. Uh, 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 Brother Jim, James, uh, 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 but for the bride of Christ, he's creating a new heaven uh, and a new city called New Jerusalem, uh, a place that will abide with him forevermore. Uh, uh, can you imagine? Uh, God uh, spoke the world in existence in uh, six days and rested the seventh, uh, uh, but he's been preparing this place for some 2,000 years. Uh, uh, friend, we can look around at all creation and say, boy, what a job he did. Uh, can can you imagine what he's doing for you and I? Uh, but notice the sights of that city. Uh, in these verses we find that city has uh, 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 walls of jasper. Jasper is a clear translucent stone. Uh, 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 we find that it has gates of pearl. Uh, not gates of pearls, uh, but gates of pearl. It said every gate of pearl. Uh, I don't know how big the gates are, uh, uh, but the gates of that city, there's 12 of them. Uh, each one is a pearl. Can you imagine the size of the oyster that uh, uh, spewed that thing out? Uh, uh, listen, uh, it has 12 foundations. Uh, each one is a precious stone. Uh, uh, it has streets of purest gold. Uh, it baffles my mind. Uh, 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 down here men kill for a little piece of gold. Uh, we're going to a place uh, where we're going to walk on it uh, and not some of this uh, 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 metal that's been uh, overlaid with gold like we have down here. Uh, uh, gold so pure that you can see through it. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, what we uh, drive and walk on down here, asphalt is nasty. Uh, uh, the nastiest thing in heaven is going to be pure gold. Get a hold of that. Uh, uh, listen, uh, it has a crystal river uh, and you find that in chapter 22 uh, hey uh, Jesus told us in John 14 uh, in my father's house are many mansions it has mansions over there uh, hey uh, uh, we find that the sites of the city it is a four squared city uh, it's the same uh, uh, size in every direction in every height everywhere you look uh, it's the same size uh, we see the sites of the city uh, notice the symbolism of the city. Uh, uh, those walls, uh, 144 cubits. Uh, if a cubit uh, is 18 inches, and I've got an old set of commentary said a cubit could have been 20 or 22 inches. Uh, if that's the case, that uh, uh, makeshift ark they built down there in Dry Ridge uh, isn't as big as the original one was. Uh, but if you use 18 inches uh, and 144 cubits, uh, just the walls of this city uh, are are 216 feet high. Uh, uh, listen, 
uh, uh, the, the walls are made of jasper uh, uh, that jasper being t- uh, translucent means uh, uh, that God uh, uh, has these walls you can look through uh, they're transparent because uh, God has nothing to hide uh, and they're flawless uh, because he is holy uh, and with him there is no flaw uh, that's why you can trust in your King James Bible. God doesn't do anything with any flaws or errors in it. Uh, 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 can I say that the gates of pearl? Uh, we mentioned those pearls, uh, but pearl is uh, pearls come about through suffering. Uh, uh, an oyster gets a little bit of, of dirt or a little something from uh, uh, the seashore inside it, and it can't excrete it out, uh, and it begins to excrete that mother of pearl over it. Uh, and through that suffering, through that heartache. Uh, uh, that precious uh, gem is made. Uh, And can I say through the suffering uh, of Mount Calvary, uh, God made a way uh, for you and I to be born again. uh, And you can't enter the city uh, without realizing it took suffering for you and I to be there. Uh, Can I say it has 12 foundations, those precious stones. Uh, I won't give you all of them, but every one of them represents something. Uh, uh, The sapphire, uh, that uh, uh, deep blue color, uh, that sapphire uh, uh, shows Christ holy and heavenly character. Uh, uh, The sardius uh, is what we call the ruby. That's the red stone. uh, That represents the blood that was shed for our sins. Uh, The topaz uh, represents the revealed word of God. Uh, Nobody's going without the word of God. We're begotten again or born again through an incorruptible seed the word of God which abideth forever uh, uh, listen uh, uh, the uh, chrysolite uh, 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 represents Christ's redemption uh, uh, the emerald represents praise and worship uh, uh, the amethyst represents the royal splendor of those uh, who belong to God uh, listen we're robed in his righteousness uh, we're justified by faith uh, but when we get there uh, and by the time we get to New Jerusalem Uh, we've already been to the judgment seat of Christ Uh, we've already been given the wedding garment Uh, we've been given a body just like him Uh, and my dear friends that day uh, uh, we'll be like Christ even in our royalty like he is we'll be a joint heir to him Uh, listen uh, uh, the barrel represents the security and satisfaction of the believer I'm glad, hallelujah, when I got saved, when I got born again, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit of God sealed me into the day of redemption. Uh, I'm glad for the security of the believer. I couldn't keep myself saved, but I'm glad Jesus could. And it also deals with the satisfaction. When I got saved, my granddaddy, when I got done dealing with God in the altar, my granddaddy said, son, are you satisfied? I said, yes, sir, I am. 48 years later I'm still satisfied with what Jesus done in my heart but I promise you when we get there we'll be satisfied with what God's done huh? there'll be no complaints in heaven I promise you that huh? we see the 12 foundations they all represent some we're talking about the sim- symbolism of the city that four squared where everything is even that shows equality God's no respecter of persons Jesus tasted death for every man huh Hey, here we have prejudice. Oh, in, in heaven, there is no prejudice. Uh, if God was prejudiced, none of us would go. Uh, but Jesus said, whosoever will may come. Huh? What a blessing. Huh? Can I say the streets of gold? Anytime you find gold in the Bible, it's always a picture of righteousness. Thank God for His righteousness which was imputed unto us. And we found down there in verses 22 and 23 that there is no sun, there is no moon that Jesus himself is the light of the city. That light shows the glory of God. But not only the glory of God, it represents something more than that. Remember Jesus said he was the light of the world? We also know the entrance of the word of God giveth light. Light is also a picture of infinite wisdom and understanding. And we'll have the mind of God when we get over there. It's infinite wisdom stemming from the fact that we'll actually be in the presence of the living word. Here we have the written word. There we'll be with the living word. huh? That's why he lights the city. We see the sights of the city. We see the symbolism of the city. But notice in chapter 22... Verse number 3, and there shall be no more curse. It's a sinless city. Uh, 
What a blessing to go to a place where there won't be any more filth. Nothing vile. Nothing damning. Uh, you can live as close to God as anybody in this world and still there'll be thoughts run through your mind that you think, well, where in that world did that come from? Yeah. When you get to heaven, you won't have any more of them thoughts. Hmm? Uh, your thoughts will be pure because they'll be the thoughts of God. Think about that. No more having to put up with the foulness and the filth and the offscour of this sorry, no good, sin cursed world. It's a sinless city. And this is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on, you know, we can look at all that and get excited about all that stuff, but that's not really what heaven's about. I want to preach on the emphasis of heaven. The emphasis of heaven. What is really going on in heaven? What is the main thing of the main thing about heaven? What's the emphasis? You listen to songs and all you hear is about is mansions and streets of gold and crowns and harps and all that stuff. And all that stuff will be there, but that won't be the emphasis. Hmm? I hate to bust some of you's bubble, but you hear a whole lot about family reunions and see a mama again on the other side. Mama's not the emphasis of heaven. Hmm? My mother's there, but she's not the emphasis of heaven. See, we've listened to a lot of unbiblical preaching and unbiblical songs, and we've grasped unbiblical concepts of what heaven should be. Do you realize Jesus preached twice as much on hell as he did heaven? You know why? Because everybody goes to heaven satisfied. But everybody goes to hell wishes they wouldn't. And he preached so much on hell as to warn people not to go there. So what is the emphasis of heaven? Can I say, first of all, the emphasis is found on the place of viewpoint. Where's everybody's attention going to be drawn? Look at chapter 22, verse number 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding, here it is, out of the throne of God. Look at verse number 3 of chapter 22. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Now see, everybody's attention is going to be drawn to the throne of God. In chapter number 4, which is, my dear friend, if you study the, the book of the Revelation, you find the messages to the seven churches, and those were seven literal churches that the angel of the Lord sent a message to those churches, uh, uh, and he told them all their good points, and he told them what the places they need to improve. The last one is the church at Laodicea. Now, a lot of people have often typed out those uh, seven churches as different ages or different uh, uh, times also in the Bible. That may be two. And the last one, the Laodicean church age, would be the last age right before the Lord takes his church out of here, and that church isn't doing real good. That church is increased with goods. And thinks they don't have need of anything. But the Lord says she's poor, wretched, blind, and naked. It amazes me that the churches today have more than they've ever had, but they have less God. Yeah. Told you all the other day, church I was raised in, we had the funeral fans, had to crank out windows because you didn't have air conditioning, didn't have padded pews, uh, used cold in the winter and hot in the summer, uh, uh, the bathrooms were out back. We didn't have a whole lot of this world's looking at what you needed for a church. They had a whole lot of God. I remember when the Independent Baptist Movement came out of the out of the storefronts. They didn't have big buildings out in the suburbs. They were in the storefronts. A lot of times met in places where they had to put out folding chairs uh, for service and then gather them up uh, uh, because it was a gymnasium or some kind of other facility during the rest of the week. Didn't have a whole lot as far as buildings and prosperity, but it had a whole lot of God. Amen. But today... Boy, we got, we got steeples and, and carpet and padded pews, and I thank God for it. Uh, 
I mean, this building, you know, pales in comparison to the old one, Brother Clint. I mean, you know, that brown carpet and them orange pews and that paneling on the wall. That was ugly and small. But it got the job done. Huh? It's ugly. We changed it. I don't have any of that stuff back over there no more. Huh? Every independent Baptist church built in the 70s had brown carpet and orange pews. I mean, they all did, huh? Paneling on the walls. But can I say, how much God do you have these days? A lot of churches have turned into museums. A lot of them have sold out. They no longer even have any familiarity with the old-time worship and old-time ways. But can I say that Laodicean church age was poor, wretched, blind, miserable, naked. He counseled them to buy of him gold tried in the fire. And he said, be zealous and repent. And yet in this day and age, people don't feel they have the need to repent. We're okay. Well, if that really is a picture of what the church is going to be right before the rapture, chapter number four starts out, and you find the picture of the rapture. John hears, come up hither. Here's a trumpet, and immediately he's in the presence of the Lord. Well, what's the first thing he sees? 1 chapter 4, verse number 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. The one that sat on the throne. In chapter 4, verse number 5, said, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, the, the place where everybody's attention, their viewpoint will be, is drawn to the throne. Not to the mansions. Not to the streets of gold. Not to the walls of jasper, the gates of pearl not to the family reunion over on the corner. No, the place that we are drawn to is the throne. It's the emphasis of heaven. We see the place of viewpoint, but I also want you to notice in the emphasis of heaven is found in the person of valor. Who is the one that gets all the attention in heaven? Let me help you with this. It isn't some big independent Baptist preacher that built a college. Mm. Huh? Uh, it isn't sister so and so that uh, won 900 people to the Lord last year of course only three of them came to church but she won 900 that tells me 880, uh, 897 converts were hers not the Lord's told you the other night everybody came to Jesus left in a different way Jesus never ever lost any of his converts mm. huh? matter of fact anytime you found somebody in the Bible truly got born again you know what they did they followed Jesus and in the book of Acts they followed the Lord in, in believers baptism and they followed the Lord in the church uh, they weren't back at the bar stool next week anyway that didn't cost you anything hmm? who's the person of valor well can I say first of all he's, he's so wonderful he reigns Revelation 19, 6 says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and a voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Amen. Revelation 5, 5, And one of the elders said, And weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Who's it talking about? It's talking about the Lord Jesus. He's the Lion. He's the Lord God Omnipotent. He's the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He's the one that will be all the emphasis will be on Him. He's so wonderful. Uh, we could go on and on and on about how wonderful He is, but He's also worshipped. We find in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, verse 8, And when He had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. Revelation 5, 14, And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. You say, what will we do in heaven? We'll worship. Say, what? what we're going to worship forever? Oh, yeah. See, down here we get tired. Down here we have limitations. Up there we have a glorified body. We'll never get tired. Say, what are we going to do? We're going to sing a song that's never been sung. 
I heard some, I heard some lame brace one time say, I know the new songs are going to be sung in heaven, Amazing Grace. Well, it ain't new. I've sang that song four million times in the last 48 years. That ain't new. We're going to sing a new song. Huh? And we're going to worship. We're going to sing and praise and bow down and worship Him forevermore. Because without Him, we'd be in the lake of fire. Say, so is that all we're going to do? I don't know, but we're going to do a whole lot of that. Mm. Say, won't we get tired to see in heaven there's only one day? There's no night there. It's one eternal day. Can I help you with something? You know why we wear these? Or why you keep it on your phone? Why you have them hanging on your wall? Because as it is appointed unto men wants to die, and after this the judgment. Every one of us have an appointed time for our life. Have you ever seen a, a, a moo cow wear a wristwatch? Huh? No. Have you ever seen a goat wear a wristwatch? You been to the zoo? You ever seen a, a polar bear wear a wristwatch? Huh? You ever seen a orangutan wear a wristwatch? Now don't look around here and look at somebody who looks like a orangutan. Huh? Your daddy. But anyway... You know why the animal kingdom doesn't wear wristwatches? First of all, the animal kingdom doesn't have a soul. Amen. Man, God did not make them a living soul. He made man a living soul. And so I'm going to bust your bubble right now. Please don't cry, Miss Noreen. Your little Fifi and Fido and little kitty cats and all that, they're not going to heaven. They don't have a soul. Now, I know you think they got a personality. I know them little bunny rabbits and stuff, y'all. You all think they're so cuddly and cute and, and they're going to be in heaven with you. No, they're not. I just read you heaven. Did you find anything about little doggies there? Huh? No? Huh? Can I say that God created the animal kingdom for our pleasure? Huh? He didn't create the animal kingdom to take to heaven? Amen. Yeah. I know that upsets some of you. Miss Pam, don't get mad at me. Boomer's not in heaven. Boomer's underneath that tree where you buried him. That's where Boomer's at. Huh? When he died, he ceased. Now, can I say? A lot of false teaching from the cult say that's what happens to man. When you die, you cease. No, man has a soul. God made man in his own image, and God breathed in him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man's soul never dies. Man's soul goes to one or two places. If he's saved, his soul goes to be with the Lord, to be absent from the body, to be in the presence of the Lord. But if he dies in his sin, just like the rich man in Luke 16, he wakes up and in hell he lifts up his eyes. Uh, uh, listen, uh, there's only two places of eternity. There's the lake of fire, uh, which death and hell be thrown into in Revelation 20. Uh, and there's uh, 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 the place that we call heaven, uh, 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 the place of the abode of God. That's where the souls of the saved go. What a blessing. Hmm? Amen. Uh, dogs don't have a soul. Monkeys don't have souls. God didn't breathe in them the breath of life. All right, there went the message right there. Everybody's all upset. Little Fifi, so cute. Don't ask me to pray for your dog. I ain't praying for your dog. I got a dog. He's cute. He's my buddy. When he dies, he'll go in the backyard and that we'll remember him. All right? That's, you know, there's, there's my buddy Champ. All right? Huh? He ain't going to heaven. Hmm? Near yours. Don't say, pray for my dog. He's sick. Well, he's a dog. Huh? Dogs get sick. That's what happens. Huh? Miss Cinda, straighten up. Don't get all upset at me because I got on your dog. Your dog's no different than them 29 deer heads she's got hanging in her house down there. If you love him so much, have him stuffed and put him on the wall. All right? Huh? I don't know. You got a bunch. I don't know. It's not twenty nine, but you got a bunch. You and brother Bob are in competition. Bob just got tired of hitting them, so he quit having them stuffed, huh? The emphasis is on him. We're going to worship him. Why are we going to worship him? Because he is worthy to be worshipped. 
Revelation uh, uh, 11, 13 says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and beasts, and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands and thousands, uh, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain uh, uh, to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing, uh, and every creature which is in heaven. Hallelujah. I put my name right next to that. Uh, and on the earth and under the earth and such as in the sea uh, and all the, uh, that are in them uh, heard I say blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne uh, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Uh, you see, my dear friends, uh, the emphasis is going to be on him. All of our attention is going to be attracted to the throne. That's the place of the viewpoint, but the person of valor is going to be the Lord because He conquered death, hell, and the grave for you and I. He, my dear friends, conquered our sin and broke the chains of our sin when we put our faith and trust in Him. What is the price of our validation? That's what the emphasis is going to be on. The price of our validation. Revelation 5, 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the other stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. He, my dear friends, became the lamb slain for our sin. Hmm? You see, that's why the Jews don't believe on him. They was looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, he's coming. But the first time he came, he came as a lamb to pay for our sins the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world he took away our sin bless his holy name and can I say the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is what washes away our sin and get a hold of this don't have time to go into all of this but when Jesus resurrected and Mary Magdalene was there in John chapter 20 to see him uh, just early resurrection morning. He said, touch me not for I have not yet fully ascended unto my Father. You see, when Jesus resurrected, he took the blood that he shed on Calvary and he took it into glory. And it sits before the throne of God on the mercy seat. If I had time, I could take you back and show you the ch church of the wilderness. Moses, when he was on the mountain, got a glimpse of the of uh, uh, the tabernacle in heaven, and that's the tabernacle that he constructed on earth. Uh, and the mercy seat uh, is a picture of the mercy seat that is in glory. Uh, and my dear friends, uh, uh, that earthly tabernacle, once a year, the blood of the Lamb had to be shed uh, and put on the mercy seat, and it pushed back their sins uh, uh, for a year. Uh, that was a picture of the day Jesus would come and shed his blood on Calvary uh, uh, to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, and listen, he took that precious, royal, redeeming blood uh, and he took it to the mercy seat before the throne of God uh, and it ever speaketh for our salvation. Uh, hey, when the devil that accuses the brethren uh, and he accuses you and I and says we ought to be damned to hell, uh, Jesus says, Father, he's in great in the palm of our hands uh, his name's written in the Lamb's book of life uh, and the blood is an everlasting covenant uh, of our salvation uh, and I say hallelujah the price of our validation uh, is in glory tonight hallelujah bless his holy name now there's a lot of preachers got this joker's books by the name of John MacArthur Jr I don't have his books and I say he got a lot of notoriety in California because uh, he uh, uh, didn't close during COVID uh, and it came out they didn't own their building and the city tried to repossess and cancel his rent because uh, he wouldn't close and he still uh, had services and I admire his stand. But can I say there's a lot of Catholics had stands. A lot of Methodists had stands. Uh, uh, a lot of cults had stands. Uh, 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 I can admire somebody's stand. I don't mean I believe their doctrine. But can I say this? John MacArthur Jr., he said this. He said this when uh, 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 he was uh, 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 in a debate with, uh, 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 
his name just left me. Got the, they got the college down there just outside of Greenville. Uh, uh, they were in debate. Uh, uh, Bob Jones and him was in debate. Uh, and uh, it come across on the blood. Uh, and John MacArthur Jr., I got the, all, uh, the article somewhere in my uh, uh, library. He said this. He said, Jesus' blood uh, was no different than a dead polecat. Uh, the earth soaked it up just like it does the polecat. He said, we're saved by Jesus' death. If that was the case, how come Jesus didn't die of a heart attack? Why did he have to shed his blood? Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And can I say, if the earth soaked up his blood, his blood was no different than our blood, and we have no hope of, of eternity tonight. And I'm glad there's a price of validation, and it's on the mercy seat in heaven. But let me say this. Our attention is drawn to the throne. The Lamb is the one that gets all the praise and glory and all of our emphasis will be on Him. We can't look at the throne and the Lamb without seeing the mercy seat and the price that it took for us to be there. But then the last emphasis of heaven is a plea beyond value. This great book that gives us the great little glimpse of what we have ends with a tremendous plea. Look at verse 17 of chapter 22. And the Spirit, if you've got the right Bible, let's capitalize. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's the last invitation of the Bible. You see, while we're here on earth, there's still a plea for sinners to come. The Spirit of God pleads for them to come. The church pleads for them to come. The Lord Himself pleads for them to come. He's, he was, he's, he proved his love on Calvary, and for 2,000 years he's been pleading for sinners to come and have their sins for, forgiven. Come and get born again. Come and become part of the family of God. See, it's a plea beyond value. Miss Taya's invitations are about ready to go out for the shower. It's always nice to get invitations. Now, I don't know. I'm old. Not as old as you, but just about. Things have gotten weird, haven't they? Couples get married now. You get a thing, save the date. Then you get another thing. Did you save the date? Because here it is again. And then you get the actual invitation with the RSVP. and Let them know you're coming. And all this stuff and everything. Used to, you know, somebody called me and said, hey, there's going to be a wedding next week. Show up, you know. Not anymore. It's a big deal now. Uh, Y'all know Hallmark specializes in getting your money. You know this is the only place in the country where there's a holiday in October called Sweetest Day. You know why? Because they need to sell cards. It is. It's the only place in the country. We've had friends come up here that weekend because that's usually my, around my anniversary as pastor here at the church. We always have a big weekend. And all them preachers come up and say, what the heck is Sweetest Day? I said, I don't know, but you better buy a card. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? I'm guilty. I never know when it is, and I never get a card. I mean, I always get one from Miss Annette, and then I feel about that tall. How many of you do that? Huh? So we go somewhere nice to eat because I done forgot the Sweetest Day deal. Huh? Huh? It's just one of them made-up holidays. Can I say there's a lot of things made up because photographers need to make money and Hallmark needs to make money and flower people need to make money and all this stuff, you know. It, it all, and, but can I say she's getting ready to send these invitations out. These invitations are personal. Miss Marcy, it would be bad if you come to church and Miss Mary says, Taya sent me a nice invitation. Did you get one? And you say, say what? <laughs> Note to everybody in the church, 
Number one, I've already invited you all. Note number two, when Miss Dawn puts out them updates, to put in the update in the directory, make sure your address is all right, make sure your phone number's all right. It's so you can get invitations in the mail. Huh? So did you update the directory? Yes. Well, you should get an invitation. Because Taya is no respecter of person. She loves Jesus. And she wants you to come. Because she wants you to buy a gift. <laughs> Because isn't that what invitations are for? We want you to come, and we want your money. Isn't that really it? You wouldn't know. You're single. Huh? He's the only happy guy in the whole bunch right there. Huh? But listen, it wasn't that funny. But listen, the Lord gives an invitation to everybody. There's a general call for the gospel, whosoever will may come. But do you realize that you don't even know anything about the Lord or was ever even thinking about the Lord till the Lord revealed himself to you? He might have done it through a co-worker. He might have done it because you was raised in church and you sit in church like this little gal and she's just having a time and she really don't know what's going on but in about five or six years she's going to start really listening. And all of a sudden, it's going to start making some sense. And she don't know that's the Lord showing her. It might have been a family member. It might have been somebody just come up off the street and handed you a, a track. But somebody initiated you wanting to know about the Lord. And it was all because the Lord put it on their heart to come to you. And then you get a specific call because he starts dealing with you. He starts making you feel unsatisfied with your life. He starts showing you problems in your life. And then he starts showing you there's an answer for your problems, and it's him. And through that conviction and that drawing, he draws you to an altar of repentance. It's all initiated from him. But here's the beauty. He doesn't want anything in return. He just wants you to put your faith in him and let him have your life. And he'll take your old, tattered, worn-out garments, sin-stained, sin-cursed life and transform it into a glorious one. He came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He takes you from death unto life because what you didn't know is you was dead in trespasses and sins. But once he saved you, he's given you eternal life. And all he wants in return is for you to love him back. That's all he wants. He don't want your money. He don't want anything. He just wants you. Because if he gets your heart, he gets all of you. Huh? And what you realize, even when you give an offering, all of it is. He allows you to enjoy your portion, and then he blesses it to go far beyond. You could have made all of it go by just being faithful and obedient and giving. I mean, he gives an invitation. And it's the sweetest thing known to man that a holy God wants you to put your trust in him so he can change your life and take you to heaven. He wants a relationship with you now and restore what was broken by sin in the garden and reunite it forever and ever and ever in glory. Adam walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. One of these days we're going to walk with the Lord. Can you imagine? What a day it's going to be. Amen. The emphasis of heaven right now is for sinners to get saved by the good grace of God. There is a plea beyond value for sinners to be saved. Jesus said it this way, What profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Can I say... Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and everybody else got any money in this world all put together. Couldn't buy one brick in them golden streets in glory. And what would it profit to have all that money and die and go to hell? Hmm? Can I say, Jesus said you can be poor in Job's turkey and still have eternal life. And that makes you richer than the richest sinner in this world. You can't put a price on being saved.
and Jesus wants to save. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you can get saved tonight. Say, preacher, I don't know how to get saved. In a moment, we're going to have a personal invitation. I'm going to invite you to come. We'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. It's easy to be saved. The tough thing about getting saved is realize you need to get saved. When you realize you need to get saved, it's easy to get saved. The Bible said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You can be saved tonight. If you're here tonight, and you're saved, and you're going to heaven, let me ask you this question. Are you going to take anybody with you? See, you can't take money to heaven. Can't take houses to heaven. Can't take goods to heaven. The only thing you can take to heaven with you are souls. You taking anybody with you? Because my dear friends, what Jesus has gone to prepare for us is so wonderful, it ought to be shared with everybody. Now you can't save them, but you can point them to him. And he can do the rest. I wonder tonight, when's the last time you was thankful you have a blessed hope you're going to heaven? When's the last time your emphasis about heaven was right? It's all about him. Not about streets of gold. Hmm? Say, why did he tell us about it? Just to whet our appetite. Just let us know that there's nothing this world has that compares to what he has. Amen. But never lose sight of the fact it's always about him. Yep. Right. And if it's not about him, it's not worth having. No. So I wonder tonight. God spoke to your heart. If so, the altars are open. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. If you're here tonight and need to be saved, once you come, we'd love to introduce you to the Savior. If you're here tonight, the Lord spoke to you hard about, it's been a while since you told him you loved him. You ought to come. Tell him you love him. You ought to come and thank him for the place he's gone to prepare for you. Maybe tonight you need to come and say, Lord, put somebody in my heart that I can have an impact in their life that they can go to heaven too. As folks are coming, they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, thank you for these thy people. Lord, in the crowd this side, I don't know anybody's heart. There may be somebody not saved. I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Lord, there's saved folks in here. Maybe they're, they put too much emphasis on this world and not enough in- emphasis on the glory world. God, I pray tonight you'd burn their heart about being a better witness. Lord, maybe you're dealing with somebody else about something totally different. Lord, whatever the need is, I pray you'd get glory in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Have your will and way. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always... Thanks for listening.